what a beautiful day. In an afternoon of inspiring talks, I see two motifs. One is a group of community activists and social entrepreneurs with a deep and abiding passion for being catalysts for change. And the second is a belief, and it was etched on the faces of those dancers, that the only way that change is going to happen is through a deep connection to our native creativity. That native creativity, that authenticity, and to beauty. We who work in business schools don't get to talk about beauty very much. We do truth. For the past 50 or 60 years, business schools have been obsessed with technical analysis and reverence for data, for rationality, and for deep analysis. We do justice. The past 20 years, certainly in the wake of the 1980s and 90s, the ethical lapses have led us to think a lot about responsibility and ethics and stakeholders but we don't do a lot of beauty. And those other two things are really important. And you can find in almost every business school catalog a course in management science or a course in business ethics, but you'll look long and hard for a course in art and the art of management or just plain beauty. My contention today is that that's a shame because leadership is an intensely visual phenomenon. Think about the words we use to describe leadership. Leaders have vision, they have focus, they have direction, they use imagination, they curate their brands, uh, they uh, design strategies. I mean, we hear probably too often these days about the art of the deal. <laughs> we hope for a generation of leaders that'll see us through all of these social problems we're facing and yet we do nothing to teach them how to see. What would happen? What would it look like if we did? I'd like to tell you three stories about that and maybe make a suggestion. The first is a story about how what became when. Andrew Carnegie, there are lots of stories we could tell about him, the Horatio Alger-like story of his rags to riches rise to business prominence. Uh, we could tell the story about labor management conflict that resulted in the Homestead strike. We could talk about Andrew Carnegie's building of U.S. Steel or the phenomenal social legacy uh, that his philanthropy has left all over the nation and indeed around the world. Um, the story I want to focus on, however, is about his eyes. When I first started to study Andrew Carnegie, I was fascinated by the pictures of him. There was always this incredible beauty to his eyes. It, they were always focused on some point out beyond the camera, and I found myself asking the question, what are they looking at? What was he seeing? Andrew Carnegie, perhaps the most important story or interesting moment in his life is the moment where he decided to quit one job and take on another. Uh, he was working for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, and as an executive at the Pennsylvania Railroad, he was the equivalent of a senior executive at Google. Um, Pennsylvania Railroad was revolutionizing society. It was uh, also reinventing the process of business, teaching people how to organize and manage across long distances, and it was an amazing place to work. And Andrew Carnegie had worked his way up from being a telegraph operator to becoming uh, the head of the Western Branch, which was essentially he was running uh, the part of the Pennsylvania Railroad from Pittsburgh. Um, and one day he decided to quit that job and buy an ironworks. Now, ironworks, um, outdated technology, uh, flat growth. Uh, all you have to know about ironworks is every small town from colonial America onward had an ironworks, and it was a dying industry. In other words, he left Google to go work for Blockbuster Video. So what did he see? Um, I think what Andrew Carnegie, I like to envision him as a 20 or 25 year old wandering through the world with eyes wide open, going on bond selling trips to London and also deciding to take a tour of a factory in which he watched them develop the process for Bessemer steel. I think he came across 
Pennsylvania with his family of Scottish immigrants and saw with them and after them generations populating the Lower East Side, traveling across Pennsylvania into the Midwest in search of opportunities, and he saw the boom in the labor force that this was creating. I think he saw the development of the country westward and the, westward and the urbanization of the country behind him, and he saw this not only in the present, but what it meant for the next five years and 10 years and 20 years. And in that, he imagined an opportunity space big enough to change the country, and he rushed into that opportunity space. And I wonder, are our leaders not only asking, what am I looking at, but when am I looking at? My second story. The second story is about how not all beautiful things are pretty. This is the obligatory moment in any TED Talk conference where we talk about Steve Jobs. <laughs> and, and to be honest, it's becoming really difficult to find something new and original to say about Steve Jobs as a result. Um, I could talk about how Steve Jobs was a set obsessed with the Bauhaus, and that's what produced our sleek and beautiful MacBook Pros and iPhones. I could talk about how Steve Jobs took a course in calligraphy, but Steve Jobs already did that. Um, and I could talk about, uh, as Walter Isaacson did, uh, how Steve Jobs could distort the perceived reality of the people around him so that they could imagine new things that they could accomplish. All of those things have already been said, but they all would have fit with some aspect of my theme, so instead I'm going to talk about what a jerk Steve Jobs was. <laughs> Steve Jobs saw something that was different from Carnegie. Steve Jobs, like Egon Schiele, saw how ugly people could be. He saw the darkness that's in humanity, the irrationality, the neediness, the sexual nature, the animal nature. He saw the complexity and richness of human beings and human mentality. He saw that we spend most of our lives just wanting to be liked. That's why I'm up here. I just want you to like me. Um, we spend most of our lives in insecurity. We spend most of our lives looking for that embrace. And then he designed a product that encompassed all of the richness of that humanity that he saw. We don't buy iPods and iPad Pros because they work or because they allow us to talk on the phone or listen to music. We buy it because we want people to think we're cool. And he knew that, and he came to understand that because he saw people as they really are. My third story, between great and small. I want to tell a third story about the kind of company that TED Talks tend to be about, the new economy, dot-com, uh, technological disruptor companies that are out there that inspire us all, but instead all I could think of to talk about was Walmart. I don't know, oh, people like to know what they're looking at. Um, these are dots. Um, <laughs> People, uh, George Seurat, I'm not really sure which is the better way to put it, that Walmart is the George Seurat of businesses or that George Seurat was the Walmart of art. Um, but it's really what my point becomes. Um, to me, the beauty of what Seurat accomplishes as a pointillist is the incredible discipline of producing these individual dots and marshalling them into line and creating out of them in the minuteness of the detail, never losing sight of the enormity of what he was trying to create. And that's what Walmart does. In every decision, every RFID tag, Every logistic center that they locate, every store that they design, every contract that they negotiate every second of every day, all 2.2 million employees, think about that, 2.2 million people all working together, putting little dots on a canvas. 2.2 million people, put that into context. There are 2.2 million active duty members of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. There are 2.2 million employees of Walmart. I don't know who would win that fight, but I do know who would have the better supply lines. 
The reality is, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I, I know who would have the better supply lines, and I also know, based on the contest between Walmart and FEMA in the reaction to the Katrina recovery, who was faster at getting supplies to storm-damaged areas and to people who were in need. And I know that out of that is the lesson for every leader and every catalyst for change who steps back and says, how can I keep in mind both the small and the large, and marshal every detail to the largest possible social impact. Now my suggestion. There are 100 people in this room. That means 100 projects. Wait a second. That's another visual management word. Projects. 100 things you hope to project upon the world. And my only suggestion to you as you embark on that after a day of inspiring talks and in all the work that you will do is make every day the visual practice of your leadership. Walk through the world imagining with eyes wide open like Carnegie. See the people you hope to help in all their complexity and richness, their beauty whether it be the strange beauty of Egon Schiele or the rational, gorgeous beauty of neoclassical art. See people for who they are, and then imagine and hold in mind both the details and the biggest picture and allow not one of your efforts to go to waste. With apologies to Gandhi, don't just be the change you want in the world. See the change you want in the world. Business school deans have moments, frequently, when parents come up to them and they sheepishly say, uh, my son or my daughter wants to major in art history. Can you talk to them? <laughs> I like those moments. Because here's what I want to tell them. Every artist should be an entrepreneur but every entrepreneur should be an artist. And my project is to imagine and realize that beautiful place between. Thank you.